Okay. Okay, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, welcome. Appreciate your patience while we get started. Today, I need to remind you as usual that we are recording this and live streaming it on YouTube and that the recorded uh, conversations will be made publicly available. And so if you don't want to be uh, seen or heard, uh, please make sure that you don't speak or, or include yourself in the meeting. Uh, I, it's uh, just a legal formality that I do have to say that. I want to thank you again. Uh, this is our last meeting in February. As usual, I, I need to remind you that uh, uh, the leaders of the group uh, are myself and Reinhard uh, Labenbacher, uh, with the able assistance that you uh, from uh, Jim Sluka and Bruce Shapiro. Uh, Reinhard and uh, Bruce are not available today. It's study section time, so they're, they're off on the relevant study section. As always, I'll also remind you that we have a Slack channel. Uh, we really would appreciate it if people would use the Slack channel. Uh, there's a transition to more Slack usage for the whole IMAG MSM project. And if you have any issues with that, please contact us. As always, I also need to tell you that uh, we'd appreciate your updates and improvements to the IMAG wiki. I realize that editing wikis is not the most exciting thing to do. It's time consuming. Content generation is always a bit of a difficulty, but uh, the more people use that, the more useful it will be. Rules of the meeting. Uh, this is a very collegial meeting. Uh, we always appreciate questions. We'd especially appreciate questions from people who don't usually speak up. And uh, if possible, we'd like to have a uh, focus on more general questions. Um, I didn't uh, clear for this week uh, whether uh, Jim Fetter and uh, Rita would be available after the meeting uh, to talk to people uh, in more detail. Uh, if you would like that uh, today, I can uh, set up a, a, a breakout session for that, but it wasn't set up for this week. We're going to start that next week more formal. Jim did ask me about that, and I said it was okay. Oh, it is? Okay. And Rita? It's okay. I said yes. Okay. Stay on for next. Okay. So I will, yes. so, so then I will, I will leave the meeting open. Uh, I don't have the breakout room set up right now, so it may take a little bit of doing to get the, the breakout set up appropriately, but we'll be able to have a little bit more informal discussion uh, for 30 minutes after the close of the formal meeting. So thank you both uh, to our, both of our speakers for uh, being willing to do that. And then I'll give people a five minute warning as usual uh, before uh, during the presentations. Uh, for the upcoming meetings, we have Yi Jang uh, from Georgia State speaking next week and Ellen Cool. Um, the following week, we have Robert Stratford uh, who will be talking about drug development issues uh, uh, and uh, Veronica Zanitsna from Emory talking about uh, the subgroup plan for innate and adaptive immune system response. We'd like very much if in the coming weeks the subgroup leads would be willing to present where their subgroups are. And so we'll try to block out uh, the, mini, the mini seminar slots uh, to allow subgroup leaders to uh, present and have a bit more active discussion in the main meeting. And so if you are the leader of a subgroup uh, who would like to present, uh, please let me know uh, Reinhardt know and Bruce and Jim Sluka know so that we can get you on the schedule. Uh, and we'd always like to have your volunteer for speaking in the mini seminars. We'd love to have your suggestions for people to uh, invite. Uh, we're going to have Denise Kirshner coming up and uh, a few other people that are very heavily involved in this kind of work. And that will be quite interesting. So without more ado, I'd like to turn over the first half of the mini seminars to uh, Professor Rita de Almeida uh, from the Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, Brazil. 
and she's going to be talking to us about transcriptogram analyses uh, for SARS-CoV-1 and COV-2 uh, immune response. Rita, Thank I'm you, going to James. turn it over to you. Okay, I will. Uh, I have to share my screen, right? Okay. So um, this is, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you and the organizers for the opportunity to, to speak about our, the work that we have been doing. Uh, it's a joint, it's a collaboration between uh, me and uh, Gilberto Thomas, who is also a professor at Porto Alegre, and uh, James Glitch. Okay. So we, we have um, applied a technique of a bio, bioinformatic analysis that um, we have been uh, developing in Brazil for, I don't know, over a decade. So let's go to the, uh, I don't know if I had a slide transition. Okay. So there we, there, I don't know why it's not. Okay, so just have to, okay. So uh, the viral, viral pandemia, it requires effective therapy for, to treat for the patients, okay? First of all, we have the strong immune responses are essential to contain the and clear the viral infection. But then on the other hand, you have excessive inflammation may damage tissues, delay tissue healing after viral clearance and lead to acute inflammatory responses or sepsis. In the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, the severity of immune response pathologies differ greatly between individuals. And with the current knowledge about the disease, we cannot predict the response in an individual such that we could um, advance the therapy before something bad happens. Okay, so we don't have this uh, knowledge. So the individual therapy requires that we associate information on the patient immune response evolution on, with the clinical symptoms and the infection spread and intensity, okay? The, 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 we need it for this modeling, for this, to make this model, to make these ideas, we need um, quantitative models, okay? The modeling of the immune response of, to SARS-CoV-2 critically depends on the identification of the most important biological mechanisms which act at different phase infection. So what are the differences, molecular differences in the immune, different, uh, immune response in different patients. Why do they you know, react differently? The point is the immune system is very complex. And uh, so if you have to answer these questions in a timing that is effective for therapy, we need um, to design personalized, personalized therapies and we need to quantitative models, okay? To construct such models, we need to associate information on the patient response and uh, what's happening with inside the patient. And uh, we need to, what's happening to the viral load and uh, also to the symptoms. Okay, it's going on, it's... Ah, okay. So what kind? Sorry. So what kind of data do we need? Okay. Um, well, we need the evolution, the time evolution, because What's happening, it happens in a very fast 
way inside them. You know, the viral enters and sometimes the, the patient is well. And then in two or three hours, it gets really worse. And uh, you didn't know if you could expect that or not. Okay. So maybe the information of these outcomes or these reactions are in some um, measurements that you can do about uh, how the expression of some genes or the protein profile or uh, some other places uh, in the, that tissue or in another tissue. And uh, so we have to integrate the extensive data from in vitro organoid and animal experiments with the more limited clinical observations in humans. And uh, when you have, uh, of course, you have to have uh, these uh, measurements of transcriptomes and the protein profiles. And when doing that, I mean, uh, everybody, I mean, not everybody, but uh, some of you are familiar with um, transcriptome and protein profiling. And the point is uh, the statistical analysis is critical. And the point is, these transcriptomes should search for the sets of covariant genes analysis. You should, you should have some analysis to interpret um, and you should look for them. Okay, so, so the idea is time and patient match data on viral load and clean associated with protein profiles and transcriptome from different tissues and organs. Of course, it's not always possible, right? Because you cannot do that for humans and people who are diseased and uh, well, we, it's, uh, there are limitations on that. But you can do for different tissues and you can do for different cell lines and you can do maybe with uh, some animal models. Okay, one part of the required measurements are transcriptomes and protein profile. And this is the focus of my, of my talk. First of all, I'm going to talk about transcriptomes. The example here are for, for transcriptomes, not for protein profile. But they are, I mean, it's to adapt for protein profiling is uh, direct. Okay, so first of all, you have uh, the transcriptomes are are produced by either RNA-seq or microarrays, and the profile of the RNA messengers are, that's, that's what they do. I mean, they do the profile of the RNA message, mRNA, produced by the cells. The human cells has a, of the order of 30,000, and many of the, these genes are not well characterized, about two thirds, depending on the definition of how well characterized. Another problem with these measurements is that they, the noise is a problem because you have biological variants and technical variants, and then you can have difficulty in uh, detect the changes in gene expression due to a treatment or a different condition. This is, uh, I mean, this is well known that these, uh, these uh, measurements have these problems. Okay, so I'm going to do what uh, transcriptograms, which is this um, analytic, uh, bioinformatic tool that we developed, what it does to deal with the noise uh, that is typical of these um, experiments. For example, in this first in this first panel here, okay, which is said random and r equals zero, what we have done is just uh, we collected in a way that I am going to explain in a minute, 10,000 genes of the human genome. And then for one given experiment, we just compared or list the full change of each one of these almost 10,000 genes that are here. They are ordered, these genes, they are uh, randomly ordered, but I tell you the way we have selected them is, um, is focused on how important or how connected to the other genes they are. So we have some scheme to order these genes. And uh, to order the genes, I mean to 
cluster the genes on this line by the way they interact or the way they are associated. If they participate in the same biological function or in the same keg pathway, okay? And so there is, there is, well, you can see there are some differences. There are more altered regions than others, but they, again, it's, it's very difficult to say that they think. Now, what we do here is to transcriptograms. It's for the same, it's for the same data, but we do a kind of a window average over these ordered list here is random list, this is orderly. And then this, um, this uh, window average, which comprises about 60 genes, uh, what they do is that they denoise, which is random, okay? And uh, by doing this, it really decreases the standard deviation of the number you assign for each one of the genes. And here is, and uh, in the line equal one, we have the divided or by the control, which is equivalent to do something like a full change, right? So in, in here, you see this small gray area, which is the standard error for the control sample. And following the red, which is the, you know, the sample that you are interested in calculating is some, it shows you some differences and it's followed by um, um, red uh, shadow as well. Well, the, the pink shadow, the shadow. What this pink is doing is the representing the, the standard arrow. What you see here, now you see here and you look here. The difference is that here the signal is much more clear and you can see wh what are the regions of this ordering thing that is um, altered with much better, much better uh, precision. Okay. So the point is, if you if you do if you see some experiment and make a uh, transcriptogram and you see a picture like this, what does it mean? I mean, what are these genes that seems to be so more intensely? Um, expressed than the control. Then you have to know what are the genes here, but you use always the same uh, ordering. So here is zero to one because we divided by the number of genes that we have selected. And, um, and uh, because sometimes we want to do some evolution analysis, so we compare different uh, organisms. But here, what you see is that uh, we have projected some uh, gene ontology terms or CAG pathways. For example, in this big peak here, which is associated to mRNA processing, what we did is just to tell you what is the probability that in this region, you will find a gene that belongs to this term. Okay, so, so you see something very, very small and then it jumps almost to 2.9. So a window of 60 genes, 30 genes to one side, 30 genes to the other side. What you see is that the probability is almost 90% are belong to the same, to the same thing. And then you do, you do it for all the, for all the ordering, and then you project different terms. What you see here is that you have terms that have to do either with uh, RNA processing or with. Uh, DNA repair, DNA prop. You have a region that is associated to cell cycle, okay? And then here you have a signaling like wind, like G protein signaling. And then you have things like uh, regulation of small GTPases, lymphocyte. And then you have, for example, here you have things that has to do with the uh, ECM. And then here you have something which is typical of um, of uh, energy metabolism. You should expect this thing. I tell you the, what happens is that when we repeat it, I mean, we didn't produce artificially these things. It was not curated to obtain this order. I will explain in one minute. 
And uh, what happens is that when you do the same process for other organisms. Just a five, five minute warning. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. So we have done it for the, the um, some um, SARS CoV 1. And uh, with, uh, we have done the transcriptograms. Okay. This is uh, a way of analyzing. It was uh, no data, it's from uh, 2013. And they considered Kalu-3 cell line selected for expression for ACE2 at MOI5. And what is wonderful, they recorded it for all these time steps, okay? And they have a microarrays, robust microarray analyzed. And then, oh, I'm sorry. I. So what we hear, you have this mock affected uh, samples of this Kalu-3, they have this mock and they have this um, um, infected with SARS-CoV-1 virus. So in the beginning, when uh, they have uh, zero hour after post infection, what you have is something like that. So you didn't see any alteration whatsoever nor for mock, not for WT, for the wild type. But after 24 hours, both mock and uh, wild type present very impressive, very different. I mean, they present some alterations that are significant. And you see that in some parts they are different, but in some others they are not. After 48 hours, the mock, the wild infected, what you see is that it's really more, um, it's completely different from the blue, but again, the blue have some very important things. So what we did next was uh, to use as control, not the mock zero, but to use to, you know, to, to analyze uh, the wild type relative to the same time mock samples. So what you have here is the difference between infecting with uh, a virus or not infecting with a virus. And uh, you can see that in the beginning, they are like that, okay? They are not almost no difference, but after some time, 24 hours or 48 hours, you can see some very impressive um, peaks of uh, and depressions that has to do with the differential expression of this thing. Okay, so here you see what happens as time goes by. Okay, so you have uh, here you, the time is passing and that's what happens to the transcriptogram or to the profile of the, of the, the thing, okay. So what we have to do is just to look at these things and see what are these peaks, which are important alterations that we have. So we chose the peaks, okay, and uh, sorry, we chose the peaks using some criterion, and uh, for each one of the peaks, we saw what happened to that peak and analyzed the genes that were um, twice, but genes without transcriptograms now and that they were uh, presenting four changes that are larger than two, either for more or for less. And we did it for all the peaks that were significant and we could find 219 genes, okay? So we just observed that some of the genes were covariant, they had the same. So we, what we did was to consider the covariance matrix for all these, these genes uh, sorry, and uh, we could cluster them in three different clusters, cluster A, cluster B, and cluster C, which have different behavior, okay? So here is it the, the uh, covariance matrix this is for, for this cluster here, which is cluster A, which goes from one and then goes back, goes down, and then you have this one goes up and then goes down. 
this uh, line here is the average of them. And then you have the same average here. And these guys go, it's, it's different the way they go. Okay, here is, you can have something which you can see all the, the congregation of these things. And you see that, and in black, what you see is the viral load. Of course, they are in different unities here and here, but you can see what's happening. And you see that the blue, the B cluster, almost follows the viral load. And uh, while the green one is, um, is, uh, is uh, just goes, uh, you know, it goes up, it doesn't go down just like that. And this one is just the mirror of uh, the, the green blue. These guys here are enriched with the mitochondrial things. And these guys are essentially, essentially the immune response. So here I have to put it here. If you could try to wrap up in another minute or two. Please. Okay. So what we could do and see that the blue thing is, um, is doing, a, 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 is playing the role of anti-inflammatory anti thing. And this is only inflammatory. You can see that because we look to the hsd one b which are in fact the cortisone cortisol. And one of them is uh, anti-inflammatory, the B2, and B1 is inflammatory. And uh, what, it, what you can see is that something that increases inflammation is in gene uh, green, and, and, and cluster green, and this is in the cluster. Because of that, we could see the difference and the difference of these two genes. These, these two clusters, the genes in two clusters, are spread in the ordering. And, uh, and uh, what's interesting is that uh, you have to pick them up. But this you would expect because uh, what you are doing is clustering by the, the, by the, the uh, biological function. And that means that um, even on one gene which is uh, anti-inflammatory, the other that is inflammatory, they may belong to the same, to the same guy. So you have to make this difference. Uh, just to show you what happens to SARS-CoV-2 and uh, I'm showing you this. The final thing is that uh, we took also the Weiler. Um, Weiler, uh, Emmanuel Weiler, they have published something that they have uh, um, analyzed SARS CoV 1 and SARS CoV 2, but they, they did uh, RNA seq, not a microarray, and they have a little different Kalu uh, 3, Kalu 3, and they were not very. I mean, the MOI was much lower than those we used by SIMS. And here you see what happens when I compare the SIMS data, which I just showed you, with the, the um, SARS-CoV-1 for Weiler. And you see here that in the beginning at four o'clock and 12 o'clock and, and after 24 hours, what you see is that the, the peaks are growing, but you can see that the peaks in the seams are the same that are presented by in the in the measurement by Weiler. And uh, because we have seams that goes longer, you can see what happens here in when you compare 20, 54 with 24. I mean the transcriptogram could um, could select which are the things that are really really different. Uh, in SARS-CoV-2 we can also do that and we can compare the, 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 the differences, okay? So we just compare the uh, SIMS data with the SARS-CoV-1 because that's what we have done. But we compare the, the, the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 for the same series. And you can see that they are there. The, the peaks are the same, okay? And the peaks being the same, only that the SARS-CoV-2 are more intense. So what we have seen is that for the uh, experiments by the same laboratories with the same techniques, that uh, in fact in Calo3, which is a lung um, cell line, uh, they elicit the same peaks to grow up, only 
that SARS-CoV-2 are more intense. If that's good or bad, I, I'm not sure, okay? And uh, sorry for uh, have, uh, okay, the, the conclusions is that uh, the infection depends on the cell line. The immune response depends on the cell line. Time course of infection depends on cell culture. DTAOs, because you have the different uh, details in the course. Uh, time course should extend for at least 72 hours post infection, at least. Time matched controls are important to account for culture uh, effects. Intraspectogram allowed to comparison of RNA seq and microarray results from different laboratories. SARS CoV 1 and SARS CoV 2 elicit similar immune responses in Kalu 3 cell lines. And uh, thank you. Sorry for having to verse again. Thank you, Rita. I understand trying to give these mini seminars is always a challenge. Trying to squeeze research into I, such a short time is difficult. Yes, uh, I'm you're being willing sorry. To do that. I, I really understood. So, so we'll, we'll move on directly to Jim Fetter and then we'll have time for discussion and questions afterwards. Uh, we have the extra half hour this time, which is very nice. So we have more time for open discussion. So. Okay, I think I um, I think I need Rita to um, to stop sharing. Sorry, yeah, stop sharing. So let me just introduce Jim Fetter from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, modeling the dynamics of coronavirus and alpha virus mm -hmm. infection. Of course, Jim has been working on viral replication modeling for many years and also develops very nice software tools. And we appreciate his being willing to give us an update on his work. Thank you, Thank you James. Uh, okay, I share. And I'll warn you at five minutes as well. Okay. Let me, uh, let's see. Um, to do one quick. Oh, is that gonna let me see you guys sort of, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, I will try to be quick and brief. Um, it's not true that I've been modeling viral replication dynamics for a long time. This is, I'm fairly new to this. And um, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit about my background before starting out here. So um, my group uh, is largely interested in modeling cell decision processes, and we use a method called rule-based modeling to do that. Uh, so we're really interested in what goes on in intracellular uh, signaling networks. And, um, you know, with the goal of eventually modeling uh, drug protein interactions and learning how to um, control the outcome of signaling processes and to direct them towards uh, therapies. We use an approach uh, called rule-based modeling that I'll describe a little bit in the next couple of slides just to give you an orientation again on the, on the kinds of technologies that we like to use. And I think they can be fruitfully brought to bear on problems um, in viral dynamics, which is something that I'm really interested in doing moving forward. Um, but as you'll see, we'll have our results on that are a little sparse at this point. Um, so uh, the software that we developed to do rule-based modeling is called BioNetGen, and we develop and maintain that software. And I'm hoping to get um, uh, to the end to show you some cool new stuff that we're doing in terms of interfacing BioNetGen uh, to make an integrated um, environment for, for modeling. So um, just to, you know, briefly, the challenges that we see in, in modeling cell regulatory networks and I think they're very similar to the kinds of challenges that you see in modeling um, intracellular uh, replication dynamics of viruses. As you, many of you know, I'm sure uh, the molecular details of these processes are extremely complex in ones that have been rather sparsely modeled. Uh, most of the models that have been developed of viral dynamics are really at the, at the scale of, you know, very, very coarsely treat what happens inside an individual cell. So um, we're interested in trying to uh, develop a finer grained uh, version of some of these models. And I think we, we can um, fruitfully use some of the methods that we've used to model signaling proteins. And there, the challenges are similar that um, signaling proteins uh, uh, are, have, have multiple sites of interaction, they're modified in multiple ways, and they can, um, you know, interact with many different other proteins. 
And this gives rise to a phenomenon that we call combinatorial complexity, um, which can be illustrated simply as, uh, you know, if you have a, even a small number of proteins that interact with each other and a simple set of interaction rules, uh, the numbers of ways that they can combine um, and give rise to chemically distinct species is combinatoric and results in um, sometimes very large and complicated models. Uh, those models are characterized by, you know, relatively small number of parameters compared to the number of actual constituent species. And so um, they should be able to be concisely described in a model and um, uh, simulated, but the, the standard tools uh, writing uh, models as differential equations don't scale well for that problem because of that problem. Um, and so rule-based modeling provides a flexible and compact way to represent biochemical interactions. Uh, so the basic, the core, uh, sorry about this spasming here. Uh, the core concept is that the um, biological molecules can be abstracted as structured objects. Uh, so instead of writing a species just as an, you know, a name of something, uh, we represent it as a a molecule with different components. Um, those components can bind to other components of the same molecule or other molecules, and they can also be um, have different conformational or post-translational states. So in this way, we can um, uh, we have a uh, representation for uh, potentially complex biochemistry. And then the rules are used to define uh, molecular interactions. And a simple example rule is um, a domain of a particular protein. Here, it's a tyrosine kinase. Uh, binds to a phosphorylated region of another protein um, to form a bond and to form a complex. And the key concept in, uh, that underlines uh, that, that uh, underlies rule-based modeling is this kind of idea of don't write, don't care. So um, th these proteins may, are multifunctional. They, they may have many other interactions with other proteins, but the interaction between the kinase and the receptor doesn't depend um, on those other interactions in the sort of coarsest level description uh, and we can write a single rule that, that captures that interaction. Typically, we describe uh, interactions by mass action kinetics or some form of generalized rate laws um, that can incorporate more complex um, biochemistry. Uh, okay, and so the, the, really the underlying idea is that we can bridge then from uh, molecular scales of individual proteins and their interactions with other proteins all the way up to this uh, network scale. We do this by abstracting the structure of um, proteins um, to have uh, these components that can interact with other proteins. And we can build up complex models of large scale networks. I mean, this way, and here I'm representing it, um, uh, a, a large network model of uh, EGFR signaling as what we call a contact map, which just shows the, the proteins and sites that have been modeled. And uh, a key point about this contact map is that it, it contains uh, the complexity of the rule set, but the underlying uh, species complexity uh, is much greater and that's handled uh, either by uh, a, an automatic network generator or by simulation algorithms that don't depend on that complexity explicitly. Um, so uh, this, the BioNetGen framework that I'm describing and standard, um, there, there are many other tools for rule-based modeling as well that I'm not talking about here, um, but the key idea is that the, the uh, Molecules and interactions are represented in a, in a concise uh, form um, as a set of rules that can be passed to an interpreter that then either uh, generates all the, the, the species and reactions that are implied by the rules um, or can carry out directly Monte Carlo simulations um, based on the, uh, the, uh, the dynamics that are, that are described in the rules. Uh, and at the end of the day, we generate uh, time courses of dynamics. We can generate steady states as well. Um, and then we use uh, those time courses, we compare those to uh, experimental observables. So you know, exactly the same kinds of uh, rule-based interactions that we use to describe host signaling network can be used to model the viral dynamic component as well. And, the, and in particular, also the interactions between uh, viral proteins and other um, uh, viral components and the host signaling pathways. So um, we got interested in uh, modeling the dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 infections, uh, like everybody else, uh, to, to, to see if there was something that we might contribute. Um, I've for a long time been interested in the idea of how um, viruses uh, interact with and co-opt uh, host uh, signaling and um, other cellular, intracellular machinery. But this was really the impetus that got me uh, to, to go in and actually try to do this in a, 
uh, somewhat systematic way. Um, and so I, I found out about the effort that was being led by Paul Macklin. And I think Paul has given a, a talk already in this series and introduced uh, some of you who may be here now uh, to the fizzy cell framework that he develops. Um, it's also, I, I met uh, James Glazier in the context of this modeling effort as well. Uh, and the goal was to develop multi-scale model of um, COVID-19 um, dynamics, uh, spanning from the subcellular level all the way up um, to the whole individual level, uh, spanning these different you know, cells, uh, what goes on inside of a cell, how cells interact with each other, um, the multiple uh, different components of the both the innate and adaptive immune uh, system that come to bear on infections, spread of cytokines, um, and, uh, and other uh, factors in the host tissue, and then ultimately how different compartments of the tissue might interact with each other during the spread of uh, an infection. And, and the goal here, it really is to, um, you know, bring into uh, a dynamical framework the, the full scope of uh, the host um, pathogen interactions and immune response with the goal of being able to, to then test different therapeutic strategies and also to understand basic um, aspects of the um, infection dynamics, which really are, are much more complex um, than uh, we, we've been able to model. So uh, uh, Paul, did a great job of bringing together this international group of collaborators uh, to develop this uh, SARS-CoV-2 tissue simulator using his uh, fizzy cell framework. Um, and uh, it, this, the consortium has involved up to uh, 40 or so people at 20 different institutions. I'm not sure how accurate that count is now. I mean, it, it's, it's grown over time. Um, and bringing together lots of people, both who are uh, very experienced in these areas and people like myself who are, who are relatively new. Um, and in a, in a uh, okay, so yeah, so uh, I should mention just briefly that the fizzy cell framework is an, is an agent-based framework for uh, modeling uh, multicellular interactions. It, it's uh, primary application uh, up to this point was to model uh, tumor growth and dynamics, um, but uh, Paul is very keen to, to bring it to bear on um, viral infection dynamics as well. And that's what the focus of this effort has been. Um, and so uh, it's really been a team science approach that um, his group has been leading, bringing together uh, people from very different backgrounds and disciplines uh, with the um, using open source tools to develop this um, simulator and to try to do it fast. Uh, and in a time when obviously we can't get together in person and we have to rely on all the different um, uh, digital virtual tools, um, both for um, in terms of Human, hu human interaction and uh, in terms of code development. So uh, that's all been great. I'm gonna focus uh, the rest of uh, my time here just on talking about uh, the model that's been developed and a little bit of the preliminary analysis just to give you a flavor um, of really some of the things, the places that we would like to go with, with these kinds of approaches. Um, so the initial version of the model was developed uh, primarily by uh, Paul and, and, and people in his group. Um, uh, in, in discussions with, uh, with others and, um, and was uh, available the, the, before I even became involved. So the core uh, framework for describing the infection of a tissue uh, was worked out before I got involved. But, um, and then uh, it has been rapidly developed. So first we had just um, individual uh, cells representing epithelial cells in a tissue uh, that had a very simple, um, uh, 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 set of modules that described the process of endocytosis and then viral replication within the host cell. Um, and th that enabled them to carry out uh, different kinds of uh, 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 simulations under different conditions to identify the, uh, at, a, at, a, at a very qualitative level, the effect of modifying different aspects of the simulator. Um, and one thing I can emphasize at this point was the goal of the rapid prototyping was to develop the framework for models that had the sort of the correct underlying um, coarse grain physical descriptions, but they uh, models have not been calibrated uh, to experimental data. And that's meant to be uh, left to the domain of people who, who adopt uh, models or subsequent efforts of the, of the, of the overall group. The, the goal here is to develop physically realistic descriptions. So um, the, the uh, immune uh, response team uh, group of this, uh, of this uh, consortium has been very active um, 
uh, in the months, I guess, in the past summer, primarily developing a quite a, an intricate model of the uh, host immune cell response to um, infection, and uh, built out the model to uh, you know a much uh, greater range of interactions and complexity. And I just show a few time courses here. I don't know if uh, if some of the others uh, who were involved have already given talks. I know um, they have uh, done a lot of additional analysis beyond what I'm presenting here. Um, my my group was primarily involved in the um, intracellular dynamics modeling. And uh, you know, initially my goal was to take this uh, very simplified version of uh, viral replication, which treats this more or less as a, as a linear cascade of events um, and to make something at, uh, a more fine grained molecular description. Uh, so far, we haven't made tremendous progress on that in part because the, uh, the there's not a tremendous amount of uh, experimental data to support that kind of effort just yet. Um, and so part of what we've been doing is trying to find collaborators who are willing to do the kinds of experiments that could inform such models. Um, and in the meantime, we've learned uh, uh, a bit about how to model these systems. Uh, first thing that we did, of course, was to translate it into a language that we like uh, to, to build models with. Um, and we wanted to explore in particular, uh, developing the capability to make uh, our, our rule-based models and to export them uh, to create modules in this larger uh, multicellular agent-based framework. So I mentioned a little bit about the, our experience in doing that before I wrap up. Um, the, uh, some key properties of this uh, model, it replicates very nicely. Um, this uh, lag phase during which uh, uh, the following the initial infection of the virus to a cell prior to uh, the export of um, of uh, virions uh, to the extracellular uh, environment. And um, one, one thing that I noticed uh, very early on in working with this model was that the number of exported virions did not match very well with uh, what was thought to be the, uh, the burst size, the viral burst size, which is uh, estimated to be in the hundreds or even a few thousands of virions per cell. And so, uh, you know, the immediate question that came up, and I, I recall having um, multiple discussions with, with James Glazier on this point early on, uh, was how does the virus amplify um, its RNA and how does it make, how does one, the infection of the cell by one virus result in the production of thousands of virions? So um, it was really- right, five, five minutes. Okay, good, good. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay, I think. Um, I put the stuff that derails me that I love to talk on and on and on about at the end. So that, that's good. Um, so uh, we, um, you know, having having talked to James and I and uh, they they published a paper and, and and I should mention that you know the Comp CompuCell 3D has been used to build a very similar kind of um, uh, multicellular agent framework uh, for modeling the infection dynamics. Uh, a key step is that there needs to be an amplification reaction in this um, the, that that amplifies the production of the full length uh, viral RNA, and putting that into the model enables there to be amplification. And enables us to then better, much better fit the time course of replication. It sort of matches much better um, the observed uh, uh, viral titers um, from cell culture experiments. And uh, it's actually interesting, you know, this the, there's still a fairly limited amount of data about the um, viral titers in various different cell culture systems. So we don't, I don't know that there's been a precise measurement of actually the burst size in uh, SARS-CoV-2 up to this point. There hadn't been last time I had checked. And in fact, our collaborators has done some um, measurements on that, which I won't present in this particular presentation. But um, what I wanted to do here just is to show briefly that, um, you know, uh, what, that we can um, learn something uh, about the model by by doing um, a sensitivity analysis. And here we did a regression-based sensitivity analysis to try to figure out what are the factors that um, of the, you know, the parameters of this model that uh, strongly um, correlate with the experimental burst size. That seems to be something that's highly variable in different, um, for certainly different um, viruses. We saw that there's a, a, almost a factor of uh, order of mag two orders of magnitude difference in the viral loads um, produced by uh, SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2 uh, in the data that I showed a little bit earlier. So we were interested in trying to identify what are the key steps in viral replication that might um, that might lead to different burst sizes. And uh, as I mentioned, we used this regression-based approach where we uh, we did multilinear regression on the uh, with respect to the model parameters on burst size. I should mention we did this in the log parameter space 
and uh, we're able to find uh, parameters that correlate with uh, a uh, change in um, birth size over around six orders of magnitude. Uh, and they're, they're sort of what you'd expect um, based on the amplification step being the, you know, a key factor that controls the, uh, the total virions that are produced. So the, the uh, parameters that are in this middle part of the, um, uh, you know, where we see large sensitivities are exactly the ones that, that we would expect. Uh, but our goal was to first to do this as a sort of a proof of concept for the, for the single cell model and then to um, have us to be able to do this kind of analysis on the multicellular model and understand how these factors play on, play up at the larger scales. So um, I had a few slides here. I'm going to go very briefly through this just to say that um, one of the areas that I think we identified as over the course of working on this um, collaborative project uh, is you know we weren't able to just plug in our BioNetGen models into the framework in a, in a very um, convenient way, and uh, this actually the fact that this all has to be, the integration has to be done by hand coding at this point, um, you know, proved to be time consuming and also, uh, you know, is, is somewhat error prone and something that I think is a target for hopefully, um, you know, future development of such frameworks to address. But uh, yeah, so th this has been a time consuming process to, to try to make sure that we validate that the implementation, uh, the implementation of these models matches the original description that we that we had encoded. Um, once we have the integration working, which it, it largely is at this point, um, we can then, as I mentioned, do sensitivity analysis on the larger model. And uh, this is really just a preliminary result, but to show that, you know, even with uh, this, this regression-based method is pretty sensitive. And so even with this relatively small numbers of samples, we're able to identify um, model parameters that correlate very strongly with uh, changes in in, uh, for example, the birth size, so measures of infectivity. Um, and uh, we're currently in the process. So one of the things that uh, we were encouraged to do was um, by, you know, as part of working on this project was to find experimental collaborators. And um, I have an expert uh, viral dynamics modeler in my neighborhood as well, who uh, I've teamed up with. And we're now co-supervising a student who's working on modeling different um, plus stranded RNA viral kinetics. That's Caroline who's listed at the bottom. Um, and uh, we're working currently to refine the, um, this replication model and incorporate more um, precise measurements of the viral kinetics and ultimately um, uh, uh, time courses that contain um, measurements of other uh, important um, uh, cellular responses such as for example, interferons at the same time. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to, uh, to develop integrated models of the cellular uh, host response that involve uh, interferon uh, signaling, and in particular, the interaction between the host and viral replication, and how that can be uh, shut down both in, a, with an inter, in, in an intracellular fashion, but also in a paracrine, autocrine, autocrine, paracrine fashion. I, I mean paracrine and something else fashion, uh, but OK. Um, and uh, we also, uh, another thing that I think is of interest is, you know, this, uh, our collaborator is an expert um, in, in studying of uh, alpha virus, which uh, is a nice model um, organism and a nice model virus to, uh, that has a much simpler uh, genome um, and is also uh, of, of health relevance, but uh, in particular for uh, biodefense efforts, um, these uh, alpha viruses, a number of them cause uh, very lethal forms of encephalitis. Um, and this, the, there's a lot of uh, interesting interplay between the virus and the host uh, that leads to um, modulation of interferon signaling that occurs not only um, within individual cells but in an, and in a uh, paracrine fashion, but also um, over uh, longer uh, distance scales. So for example, um, infection in the uh, in the periphery of a mouse, so in the mouse foot pad, for example, um, if if cells are triggered in the right way to produce um, interferons, that can be protective for uh, against the encephalitis uh, infection of the brain subsequently. Um, and and the uh, and these kind of, these uh, alpha number of alpha viruses have developed uh, pretty sophisticated means to evade uh, immune detection uh, near the site of infection or in draining lymph nodes. Um, that prevents uh, this from happening. 
So uh, just I'll, I'll stop, I'll wrap up there and, and acknowledge um, all my collaborators I've mentioned as going along and plug for various um, uh, modeling tools. Uh, the, we have our own multi-scale modeling center uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, this, called, this thing called MMBIOS. Um, and we're focused largely on the intracellular scale. So going from proteins up to um, spatial and uh, uh, simulations of cellular, intracellular dynamics. Uh, and so I think there, we have a lot of um, nice computational tools to contribute to uh, viral modeling efforts there. Uh, I wanted to put in a very short plug for um, uh, a recent um, extension we wrote for VS Code that I think provides a very nice integrated uh, environment for modeling and for connecting um, uh, proprietary modeling languages like the BioNetGen or special purpose languages like BioNetGen to um, uh, code development efforts based in Python and other languages, uh, which the VS, which VS Code provides a nice um, environment for. Uh, the modular structure of this um, system has let us uh, sort of replicate the integrated development environment we had previously in Eclipse. We can, um, so we can run simulations and make plots. Uh, we can export um, uh, Jupyter notebooks um, and, and make models accessible to various different frameworks uh, in, a, in a very straightforward way. So we're looking forward to furthering, further developing those capabilities. And I think it's a, this is a, a place and a, and a framework where a lot of our multi-scale efforts um, could be uh, could be supported uh, nicely. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Okay, our meeting time is Ooh. over formally, but we have a half an hour for breakout rooms. Now, I hope the, our speakers and our audience, those of whom wish to ask questions, will attend. I have set it up so you should be able to join the breakout rooms. So there's two breakout rooms. One of them named. Uh, transcriptograms, Rita de Almeida, and one named Vial Replication, uh, Jim Fetter. If anybody needs help being assigned to a breakout room, uh, please let me know. Uh, Jim, I would, I'm going to put you into yours, if that's all right. And uh, Rita, I will put you into yours. Okay, thank you. And if, if people have, uh, if does anybody wish, wish to join a breakout room? 